All right, you guys about ready? This is a uh, tremendous amount of information to learn in a weekend. You need to listen to it over and over and over again. I have drives available if you want them. We have a website available, state national website. Um, there are so much to learn for you guys. I, I get it. It's hard. It's hard to get it all in one weekend. I'm trying to give you 38 years of knowledge in a weekend. <laughs> You're doing great. <laughs> You're welcome. I was... Uh, I was blessed at a very young age with the ability to read and the ability to read fast and the ability to retain what I read. And uh, so I've, I've read a tremendous amount of material in my lifetime. And nothing that you read is worth anything if you don't know God. One of, the, one of the missions I did, they sent me into the basement of the Vatican with five Hebrew in, uh, translators. And uh, we brought out some books. And they're available to all of you, and they have been since we did that in the 80s. And uh, most of you know what books those are. But what I'm going to tell you is there's many, many more. The Bible would be about that thick if everything was interpreted. And they're still finding scrolls. In January 23rd of this year, they found some scrolls. Unfortunately, the people that found them were amateurs and pretty much destroyed them. There's a great amount of knowledge we don't know. All we can do is take what we have and try and put those pieces of the puzzle together. One thing I've always been good at, because my mom taught me at a very young age, is she used to hide the box top. And she'd dump out a 10,000 piece puzzle on the floor when I was five. And she'd hide the box top. It was a blessing in disguise because it helped me to pull out, read things and pull out information. And that's one thing I've been good at. Edward Mandel House said only one in a million could ever figure this out. Anybody, everybody know who Edward Mandel House was? Couple, that's it. Edward Mandel House was a Texas oil billionaire. He never served one day in government ever. He held the ear of presidents and bankers. Somewhere in all this stuff. I have Edward, but I don't need it. Edward Mandel House. Mandel. Edward Mandel House. He's the one that put together the meeting at Jekyll Island with the bankers, the Federal Reserve, along with Aldrich, the Aldrich Plan, which in the Bible, that was the monster that rised up out of the sea. And that was the Aldrich drawing. In fact, I have it on here. I've got a PowerPoint of the history, just the history of how all these things unfolded and how it took place in every act of Congress. Okay, I've studied it all. I used to play these PowerPoints for classes. 
problem is they take a long time. And we don't have that time anymore. We've got to learn this stuff very quickly. So I'm giving you the basics of how things work. If you can take the basics and do something with them, that's better than having to spend years studying every little detail. Okay. I've spent years studying every little detail. I don't recommend it. <laughs> I could have been fishing. <laughs> See. <sighs> I've told Ananda on our way down here, I've got this plaque on my wall in my office at home. And it uh, was from second grade. And it said, David Strait read every book in the library. <laughs> I don't think any other kid had ever done that before. Yeah, anyway. Huh? <laughs> I would doubt any kid has ever done it since. Okay. I'm not bragging on myself. What I'm telling you is I, I'm trying to tell you is I read, uh, by the end of high school, I could read like 1,460 words a minute. And I read everything. Everything I could get my hands on. I was an avid reader. I'd even go to the grocery store with my mom. And I'd walk in and I'd hit the magazine and book aisle and I'd read it all while she was shopping. <laughs> all of it. I'd run through Forbes, like, tuk, 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 tuk. see what was going on. Newsweek, tuk, 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 tuk. knew what was going on in the world. My mom never turned on a TV. She'd say, David, what's happening? <laughs> <laughs> Sue Juris, one who has all the rights to which a free man is entitled. One who is not under the power of another as a slave, a minor, and the like. To make a valid contract, a person must, in general, be sui juris. <coughs> it's pretty, uh, pretty clear what that term means. That's the legal definition. It means of one's own right. If you don't know who you are, and you don't know who they are, you don't know what weapons they have in their arsenal and what beaches they're fighting on. How are you going to win? It's impossible to win. Everybody goes into court and goes, man, I thought I did a really good job. And I lost. Huh. Wonder why. It's not that you didn't do a bad job. You went in there arguing the facts. The facts. I'm here to tell you right now that no fact or truth shall be tried in court. That's not what it's about. They don't care. That's their motto. No fact or truth shall be tried in court. I'm telling you that at this point in time for a reason. Stop asking and be as king. Under the Public Charitable Trust, there's 337 million of us with SESTA QV trusts that are worth hundreds of millions of dollars. We go out and earn our living, can barely pay our rent and our house payment and our car payments. And you're all struggling and having a hard time and you've got 100 million in the bank. <laughs> Doesn't that suck? <laughs> See, the king, the king sits up on his throne, and he's busy. He's busy running in a kingdom. He's got things to do. And once you've attained your status and your standing, and you, you know your jurisdiction, you take a dominion, and I'm going to talk about dominion in a minute. And you get a presentment in the mail. doesn't matter if it's a bill if it's an invoice, if it's a power, power bill, it's a presentment. They're presenting you with something. 
That's all it is. Start thinking of it that way. Oh, look. Went to my mailbox today and I got five presentments. And I'm busy. I got things to do. So you open up your presentments and you only have two choices. Do you know what your two choices are? To accept them or rescind them. It's acceptance or rescission. Look up the word rescission. It means as if it never happened. Look up the word acceptance. It means to pay something through your trust, to authorize it, to be paid. United States code is our friend. Make the United States code your friend. It says the Secretary of the Treasury is responsible for all debts. All debts of the people of the United States and its SESTA QB trusts. So all I got to do is say I got my presentment and I stamp it received date and time. And I sign my name in purple because I'm the king. And I put my king's seal on it. And I look at it and I go, okay, it's a bill from Central Electric Co-op, my utility company. Ah, acceptance, date and time. Signed by me, a specific way. It's my all caps name hyphen vessel in all caps written out and then it is by David Lester Strait hyphen executor and then I stamp it and I mail it back to him and I'm done and I'm done I don't send no check with it I don't have to my account's got a few hundred million in it what do I need to pay for it I'm not the debtor, I'm the creditor. TransUnion, Equifax, and Experian is your credit report. It's what companies you lent money to. You're the creditor, it's not your debit report. Oh, Understand diction? They call it a credit bureau, not a debit bureau. It's not who owned you money, it's who you lent money to. If I go fill out an application and I sign my name on it as executor of my vessel, and it happens to be a $2,000 Capital One credit card bill or application, and they send me a credit card in the mail, what happens? I've got a 72-hour right of rescission. A 72-hour right of rescission. And then I can activate the card if I accept its terms and conditions. And now I take that credit card and I go out and I start charging on it. And I run up some fuel at the gas station and go buy something, whatever. And then they send me out an invoice, a presentment. And I've got 30 days to pay it. Now, sometimes the king's busy and he puts it under a magnet on the fridge. No, I don't do that, but some, a lot of people do. And they meant to pay it, but they forget. And at the end of the 30 days, they get another presentment. And it says, past due, you got 15 days to pay. And they give you 15 days. And if you put that under the magnet and you forget about it, at the end of that 15 days, you now owe the full balance due. So if you charged up $1,000, you don't just owe that $25 payment. You owe the 1000 And they send you a 10-day opportunity to cure. You got 10 days to pay it. If you don't pay it in 10 days, it's judgment day. Standard banking procedure, 72301510 judgment day. 
this is how we state nationals handle everything. I'm teaching you a very valuable lesson right here. Don't stick things under magnets on your refrigerator. No, that's not the lesson, <laughs> but it is. It's not the lesson. When our public servants step outside that box, they owe us some money. Mm -hmm. They committed an emolument violation. They used their position of power for illicit profit or gain. And our job, we only have two jobs in life, guys. Two jobs. Correct the errors our public servants make and to educate them so they don't do it again. If you ain't doing your two jobs, that's why corruption happens. Because you're not doing it. You're just acquiescing. You're just bending over, letting them do whatever they want to you as a slave, getting down on your knees and bowing to the master. No, I charge them. So I drive that 20 miles an hour over the speed limit, and they stop me. And I go, hi, officer, how you doing? Hope you're having a good day. And I sincerely mean that. I want you to go home to your family at night. That's how I treat them, like they're my neighbor. I treat them like we're going out for coffee afterwards. No problem. I handle things nicely. And he says, you were going a little fast there. Can I have your driver's license, proof of insurance, or registration, please? And I go, nope. These are the only documents I use while I'm traveling. And I hand them to him. Hey. <laughs> and the first paragraph in this document says, the Secretary of State of the United States of America. Oh, he has a little more clout than that police officer, I think. Hereby request all whom it may concern, that's the police officer, to permit the citizen or national of the United States named herein to pass without delay or hindrance. And in the case of need, to offer all lawful aid and protection. It means if my wife's in the back seat having a baby, his only job is to put his damn lights on and clear me a path before I pass him. That's his only job. See, the police officer, when he walks up the window, he's, he asked you the wrong question. He should have said, are you operating in commerce or are you operating in the private? That should have been his first question. But who trains the police officers? The county attorney. <laughs> the bar. The bar trains the cop. Now, he's a nice guy. When he was five years old, pushing a cop car around on the floor, thinking he was going to grow up and serve and help the public. Little did he know. <laughs> he didn't know anything. He goes into his job, goes into work one day, his first day on the job, and the county attorney comes in and teaches him how to collect revenue. Right? Right? Policy. God, people just don't know what words mean, even if they're written on, down the side of a cop car. They haven't got a clue. We're so stupid out there. That says policy. Policy Enforcement Revenue Collection Officer. People ask me, they say, David, are you for defunding the police? I say, hell yeah. Let's just take all their money away from them, dissolve the corporation. We don't need them. And let's put good law enforcement back in. One that has a duty to protect. See, the Supreme Court has ruled that no police force in the United States has a duty to protect. Only law enforcement does. And when they said that, I go, oh my gosh, do we have law enforcement? Who is that? Who's law enforcement? Who's law enforcement? Who's law enforcement? 
Oh, wait a minute. It's a militia. It's the United States Marshals. The only two groups with law enforcement capability. These idiots down here, they say, oh, you got, some, you got a problem. You better call the FBI. Yeah. 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 Uh-huh. The FBI. The FBI was created in 1908 by a secretary of the Department of Justice. They have no corporate charter from Congress to even exist. They have no authority whatsoever. They were put into place to investigate and cover up six crimes that the deep state commits. Yeah, you listen? I love suing FBI agents. It's so much fun. And we beat them all the time. They don't have any authority. They come knocking at my gate. I walk up to them and I say, hi, officer. How you doing? I, I hope you're having a good day. <laughs> and they say, David, I'd like to talk to you. I said, well, you want to come in, take your badge and your gun off and lay it down on your seat and come in for coffee? That'll be fine. But if you're here on official business, you don't have any authority. So truck off on down the road and find somebody else who will bend over. I love the guy. He's my neighbor. But if he's in his official capacity, he has no business even speaking to me. I'm the king. And that's the way I treat him. Nicely. <laughs> okay. And they continue to try and talk, right? I say, you're awesome. You're... Officer, I am happy to answer any questions you have as soon as you return and provide me with your copy of your congressional charter. <laughs> you see, I know because I have a letter from the Library of Congress that says the FBI doesn't have a congressional charter. And it also says that when they asked for one, formally, they were denied. By Congress, our legislators, they were denied. You understand what I'm getting at here? Policy, they, who are they? Who are they? Since governments have chosen to incorporate themselves, they must follow the same rules as any other corporation. Wait a minute. They might as well have a McDonald's t-shirt on. Uh, there's always Barber College. We the people lay down the laws. We, the people. Who are we, the people? You ain't one. Unless you've changed your status. Did you send an affidavit of repudiation to the Secretary of State of the United States? Did you get your passport to reflect that status? If you haven't done those two things, there are thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people claiming to be state nationals who are not. Because those are the only two things that are required. Everything else that people do shows their intent. And intent is important in the law. It's very important. Did you have the intent to commit a crime? I bet your attorney never even brought that up in court. Right. <laughs> You're kidding me. When I went into the federal courtroom with Jamie, with Judge Mosman... The very first thing I said was, where was Jamie's intent to commit a crime, Your Honor? And he goes, thumbs through her paperwork. He looks over at the prosecutor. 
And he says, in trial, I don't think on count one and count five, you proved your intent. I'm dismissing those two charges right now. And then he goes, wait a minute, I don't think you did it on count three either. I'm taking that one out. Now she's down to two charges. I just took her from 20 years to 10 after her trial. Or she'd been tried and found guilty by a jury of her peers. Now they weren't her peers. Do you know what the legal definition of the word peers is? <sighs> Nobody knows. It's somebody from your own neighborhood who knows you, who knows your character and your situation in life. Only then can a man be truly judged. See, people don't even know the law. They don't know what definitions mean. So you walk into a courtroom and they're having a jury trial and the, they've come in there and they pre-picked your jury and made sure none of those people on there know who you are or know what your character is. They made sure of it. And then they called it a jury trial instead of a trial by jury. We the people are entitled to a trial by jury. A trial by jury means the decision of the jury is final. Now, in Jamie's case, I'm glad it wasn't. <laughs> because I could work with the judge. I could destroy him. I couldn't have destroyed a, a, a trial by jury. But see, in a jury trial, the judge can still override the jury's decision. So they want you to have a jury trial. Federal agents that infiltrate patriot groups out there teach these patriots that to do a jury trial, jury trial, jury trial, like John Snow. Now, some of you will know that name because you're in one of those patriot groups. I made him admit to me four years ago that he was a federal agent. Every patriot group has federal agents in it. You know why I shook all your hands? Why I walked around? Because I touched your spirit and I knew who you were. And I, I've been trained to do that. Can that be taught? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I had to learn it. Fortunately, not one of you. <laughs> Prove me different. If there is any federal agents in here, get your badge out. Show me. You know, if I ask that, you have to comply, right? And there's not one. I knew that already. The difference between police and law enforcement is huge. We need to be going into our city managers. We need to be going into our county commissioner's offices. We need to be telling them to dissolve the corporation. These guys out there like Richard Mack, who hangs up on me all the time now, he says that he's a constitutional sheriff. And I used to be a sheriff, and I used to be a member of the Constitutional Sheriff's Association. And let me tell you something. There ain't any constitutional sheriffs, no matter what they'd like to believe and what they call themselves. Now, they may have the best of intentions, but one cannot serve two masters. And they can't be a constitutional sheriff and get paid a paycheck by the county. See, if I was going to run for sheriff now, I would run for the people. And I would go to the people and I would say, hi, how are you? Tell me your name. And I would get to know my people. Right. And I would say, I'd like to be a constitutional sheriff of law enforcement, and I'd like to protect you and your rights at all costs. If you should elect me, I'm going to ask you for a hundred dollars a month, everyone in my county, and that will be my sheriff's budget. And I'm going to tell the county to go stick their checks where the sun don't shine. <laughs> and I won't take a paycheck from them. Just like President Trump didn't take a paycheck. Okay. 
and I'd be a constitutional sheriff and I would stop any other agencies of government from entering my county and coming after my people. Yep, no OSHA. No OLCC or whatever it is, Oregon Liquor Control Commission. No, none of that. No BLM. I already had an argument with a 44 Magnum and a, a uh, <clears throat> United States Forest Service worker. He told me to get off his land. So I educated him very well, and I was wearing a 44 revolver. And I educated him. I said, this is my land. Don't you ever forget it. I told him to call Sheriff Stiles and get his ass up here, and it's Sunday. And we're 45 minutes from his office. You get him up here. He and I had coffee yesterday. I said, you know that little thing over there on your truck that says law enforcement on the front fender? I said, bullshit. You don't have any authority. You don't have a congressional charter from Congress to be law enforcement. That's policy. That's shit made up. It's SMU. Okay? See, I have this right here, and I carry one with me at all times. And it says, I have the power. I have the authority. I'm a we the people, a state national. You're my public servant. Now get the hell off my land. Or we'll see who's the quicker draw. <laughs> Well, he got in his car and he went away. I don't know why. Mystery to me. I don't know why, but I don't back down. God told me not to. He said, David, stand strong against Goliath. Don't back down. Now, be nice about it. He told me to turn the other cheek. But he also said, you might have to sell your cloak and buy a sword and smite evil down wherever it lays. So you do. And you have the same power that I do. Every one of you. She's a warrior. He's a warrior. She's a warrior. Clark, I, I know he's a warrior. <laughs> Just kidding. I love him to death. I only pick on people I love. <laughs> okay, I understand that. He helped to rescue a Dodge pickup yesterday. She didn't need any rescuing, but the Dodge did. That's why I drive a Chevy. <laughs> that was way too much fun. Sorry. Oh, you got to have fun doing this. Anyway. Yes. Oh, I love to educate them. <laughs> I carry one of these in a file folder on my dash most of the time. I don't much need it anymore because I have it memorized, but this is, uh, they like case law, right? Our policy enforcement agents and our attorneys love case law. Case law is just shit made up. <laughs> it is an opine, it's opinion of a judge somewhere. That judge could have been racially biased, politically motivated. He might not have liked the way you looked or the way you talked and he ruled against you. And now you're gonna use that against me? 
I don't allow them to use case law against me in my court. But they seem to like it, so it's okay for me to use it against them. <laughs> if the state converts your right into a privilege and issues a license and a fee for it, you can ignore the license and a fee and engage the right with the impunity. Wow. What? <laughs> Jeez. Shuttlesworth versus Birmingham. The right of a citizen to travel upon the public highways to operate an automobile is not a mere privilege which the city may permit or prohibit at will. Thompson versus Smith. The police power of the state must be exercised in subordination to the provisions of the U.S. Constitution. I go into diplomatic immunity in here on and on and on. There's pages and pages and pages of case law in here. The attempt of a state officer to enforce an unconstitutional statute is a proceeding without authority. It is an illegal act, and the officer is stripped of his official charter and is subjected to his person to the consequences of his individual conduct. The state has no power to impart to its officer immunity from responsibility to the supreme authority of the United States, the people. An officer may be held in damages, liable in damages to any person injured in consequence of a breach of any of the duties connected with his office. The liability for nonfeasance, misfeasance, or malfeasance in office is in an individual, not his official capacity. So I just sued two FBI agents in the state of Montana. Oh, this is fun. I guess I'm gonna go through this a little more than I thought I was going to. <laughs> So I named the United States in the lawsuit. I named the Department of Justice. I named William Barr. Oh, William Barr, you guys, I, I heard a wrong opinion here for a minute. Okay. He had two things to accomplish in his office, and he did them. Okay. I named the Federal Bureau of Investigations. I named the officers personally. I'm just going to write person here. Personally. I named the county of Gallatin County and their sheriff's department and their officers personally. I named the city of Bozeman and their police department and their officers personally. And I named all these people. And I don't sue in state court because that's where they live. That's where they work. That's who they go golfing with. That's who they go to lunch with. So I flew my lawsuit to Washington, D.C. and right across from the White House, used to be called the International Court of Claims. It's now just called the Court of Claims. And I spent my $400 there for its filing fee with an offer and compromise right off the bat. I said, Mr. Judge, Court of Claims, I will remove the liability of the United States. I will remove the liability of the Department of Justice. I will remove the liability of William Barr. I will remove the liability from the FBI. I will remove the liability from Gallatin County and the Gallatin County Sheriff's Department and the City of Bozeman and the City of Bozeman Police Department as long as you remove the immunity of all the persons named. And the Court of Claims goes, that sounds fair. We'll stamp that order. And I said, well, I need one more favor. I said, now that you've removed their immunity, I said, I want you to refer it back to the federal circuit court in Montana. And I want you to add a criminal referral on each of them. And why? 
because any officer may be held liable and damages to any person injured in consequence of a breach of any of their duties connected with their office. The liability for nonfeasance, misfeasance, or malfeasance in an office is in his individual, not his official capacity. And the judge of the court of claims goes, okay. So now I have an order from the court of claims where I go back to the Federal Circuit Court in Montana where those FBI agents are in there with the judges and doing cases all day long and they probably go out to dinner together. And I've got an order from a higher court removing their immunity. <laughs> and then in our first hearing, I'm on my way up to do a seminar like this in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho. And I forgot just momentarily that there's a one hour time difference between Oregon and Montana. And I was going to drive for an hour, pull off the side of the road, and dial in on Zoom to my court hearing. Instead, I had to do it in my driveway because I was an hour off. And I was five minutes late. And when you're on Zoom in a courtroom, it dings real loud when you call in, and it lets somebody know that they're there. And this angry old fart of a judge he says, I thought all the parties were present. Who just dialed in? And I said, well, Your Honor, it's me, David Strait. He goes, I don't see your name anywhere on this paperwork. Well, I said, really? How about the fact that in the body of the thing, I'm the fiduciary of MRPR. MRPR is the company that my friends had that the FBI attacked and I said, make me chief financial officer of your corporation. Because they raided a business and they stole a lot of stuff. And they left an inventory list that would have fit in a Rubbermaid container in the back of a Mini Cooper, but they hauled away a U-Haul full of shit and it took them 14 hours to load it. But see, they stole. They stepped outside their scope and authority. In fact, nothing they did take was on their warrant because their warrant was shit made up. SMU. Let's see. So I get on there and I go, I'm the fiduciary, Your Honor. I'm the one with financial, a financial obligation to protect my clients and my company. They're the CEOs, but I'm the chief financial officer. I hold that position in trust. Your Honor, and when I said those words, it got very silent for a long time. <laughs> Just like this, silence. And he says, okay then. <laughs> okay then. And he was so flustered that all he could do is set a date for the next hearing. And we were done in about three minutes. He set a date for the next hearing. Well, the next hearing came up, and the chief financial officer was a, the trustee was in the room. And he's trying to put the immunity back on the officers, saying they were acting in their capacity as a federal agent and county sheriffs and city police because they showed up with a whole team of people for this one little old lady and her business. <laughs> yeah, show of force. How great, right? Them and their guns with their tasers and their armored vehicles and their body armor and they're all tough, a little Asian woman about this tall who cooks real good, makes me good desserts. But, but she's so damn dangerous, you know, they have to show up with a whole bunch of people. Yeah, they do. They got to show that force. So I used it against them. They showed up in force. A foreign army of invaders. I had that in my documents. Foreign to them. 
These two I made state nationals a couple of years ago. Oh, they should never have done that. So anyway, we're getting ready to change the drapes on their homes. You know how fun it is to stand in court and look at an FBI agent and say, what color drapes are in your house? He was surprised when I served him because in Montana, every property is a long ways from somewhere else. And his driveway is real long and he had a gate. And I gave the server agent the gate code. <laughs> See, I know my enemy when I go to war. When I was in Judge Mosman's court, I said, I walked in and I says, hey, Judge Mosman, how you doing? How, how's Jane and the kids? I see your daughter's about ready to graduate from high school. What college is she going into? She's not going to be a lawyer just like you, is she? Freaked him out. <laughs> how do you like living up in the West Hills there? It's a nice little drive you live on. How do you like that? When are we going out for tacos? I'm happy to take you out for tacos. We can, we can talk a little bit about what the law is. How many of you know, know your judge? I've never been in that courtroom before that. I didn't know who he was. But before I stepped my foot in that building, I knew everything about the man. I even knew that he was LDS. And that he went to church every Sunday. I know what the basic principles of his gospel are. And I'm going to call him out on it. And I'm going to do it nicely, just like this. Calm and cool, collected. Most of the time when I'm in courtroom, I'm standing just like this. Dressed just like this. And when I'm speaking to the judge, I'm speaking to the judge, and I'm looking him right in the eye. And when I'm talking to a jury, I'm talking to the jury, and I'm looking him right in the eye. And when I'm calling out the prosecutor for all the fraud in which he's committing, I'm looking him right in the eye. And nothing moves but this. And if you might be tactical, you might understand this. <laughs> you understand it's the same move, right? I just... My weapon is my diction. This helps give you guys the power. See, you need to stand. You need to go into your court cases smiling. When I go into court, I sit in the back of the room. I'm going to turn my barricade around now. I sit in the back of the room. And when the judge walks in, the bailiff goes, all rise for the Honorable Bob Smith. I make a concerted effort to lean back and put my feet up. Because that's what the boss does when the employee walks into the room. <laughs> See? Slaves rise when they're told. So when the boss walks in the room, the employees stand up, see. But I don't, I don't turn over jurisdiction right there at all. When he calls me by name, I stand up. When my very first foot hits the floor, I start talking. Well, I got to get a lot of words out before I get up front. I say, I'm here, Your Honor by special divine appearance, calling for a constitutional court of record to ask for a summary judgment of the truth and the facts put down in my documents, my court of record. And then I get ready. And I lay out my peace flag and I lay out my gold and my silver and I lay out my trust and I lay out my superior titles and I lay out 
my contracts, having taken dominion over my jurisdictions. And then I say, I'm ready, Your Honor. Are you? And I just do it nicely, calmly, and nicely. And when he gives me an opportunity to speak again, because it's now his turn for a second, he's got a little business he's got to take care of at this point. I've scared the crap out of him. <laughs> okay. When it comes back to me, I say, I'm in peace and I'm in honor, Your Honor. I expect you to remain in honor as well. I have my trusts in hand, Your Honor. It clearly states who the executor, who the trustee is, and who the beneficiary is. And it ain't you, and it ain't the prosecutor. So you must be acting as executor de son tort or false executor. For I am the true executor of the estate. And then I say, and your honor, I have my superior titles. I can lose things up here faster than anybody on earth. I have my superior titles, my apostilled birth certificates, my manufacturer's statement of origins on my vehicles, my land patents and grant deeds on my property. See, I'm the king. I own my castle. Do you? Your Honor, Here's my gold and silver. I will not be considered a pauper. For the money I have on this table is more money than you have in your bank account. And your honor, I have my contracts. I have my trademarks, my copyrights, and my patents. Are you willing to commit patent infringement, copyright infringement, or say I'm in breach of a contract? See, Your Honor, I am fully unaware of any contract that could compel me to perform. And if there is such a contract, bring it forward, and I'll follow it to the full extent of the law. But if there's not, we're done here. The king is busy. <laughs> Okay, just dismiss the case with prejudice. We'll call it a day. You want to go out for tacos? <laughs> you think that's funny? I do it all the time. When you have your affairs in order, you precede that court. What is a summons? It's a seance. Summons equals seance. They're calling the dead into court, and you just appear. It's called general appearance. They've done their ritual in their black robes, and they've called you in, and you just appear by general appearance. There's only two ways to appear in court, general and special. See, what I said when I got up off the chair and I put my fir first foot forward was I'm here, Your Honor, by special divine appearance calling for a constitutional court. Did you hear what I said? <laughs> by special divine appearance. I'm a living soul. I'm calling for a constitutional court of record to ask for a summary judgment of the truth and the facts placed upon the record by my documents, my court of record. When you appear by special appearance, you are there for one, you are turning over, let's say it this way, you are turning over jurisdiction for one reason and one reason only, and that's to settle the matter. That's it. Not to be fined, not to get jail time, not for anything else. It's to settle the matter. 
What is an indictment? Okay, who's been indicted in here? Oh, come on, be honest. Somebody has. In a room this size, there's almost always one indictment. All right. I'm glad I'm in a righteous group. No. But a grand jury will indict a ham sandwich because it's only going to listen to the prosecutor's side of the evidence. And he makes shit up. He lies. See, they can get up on stage and a prosecutor can get up on stage and lie their butts off. And if you don't object, then his lies become the truth and the fact on the record. That's why your attorney says, shh, don't say anything. We'll handle it later. It has to be objected to right now, right then. If his lips are moving, he's lying, and every word that comes out of his mouth, I object to. Where was the intent to commit a crime, Your Honor? Where was the first-hand witness? Where was the cooperating witness? Who swore under the oath of a penalty of perjury that I did anything wrong? Let me see their testimony, their affidavit. Where is it? Well, the officers put in an affidavit. The officer got there 20 minutes after the event. How did he witness anything? Got to kick their asses. <laughs> they don't even know what questions to ask. See, most of us lose simply because we acquiesced. Because we're minors, we're incompetent, we're infirmed, we're unable to be sui juris because we haven't taken dominion of our jurises. That land, air, and water, that's your jurises. Doesn't that qualify as child abuse? <laughs> well, it sure as heck should. No, you are nothing more than a minor as a citizen, person, or resident, a slave to the state, your chattel property. You're an asset. See, an indictment is a true bill. A true bill. It's an invoice. It's a presentment. Here, you've been indicted on four counts of fraud. Well, great. They presented me with something. I'm the king. Oh, it looks like shit made up. I'm just going to rescission it. Send it back. What does the word rescission mean in the law? As if it never happened. You got a 72 hour right to refuse anything, any contract. How come you don't? See, they give you an invoice and you, there's no number on here. They didn't tell you how much the invoice was. It says a true bill right there by the, by the grand jury signature. It says it's a true bill. And you never bothered to ask, well, how much is the penal sum? The what? Yeah, the penal sum. Every crime's assigned a penal sum. Four felony counts of fraud, that's two million each. It's an eight million dollar bill. They sure as hell didn't want to put that in writing. So they don't put eight million dollars on here for your four counts. No, they don't want you to know that. So if you don't pay the bill, you put it on your refrigerator. <laughs> then they bring you up on charges. And you don't bother to say, well, that's my next presentment, the charges. And you don't bother to say, well, great. How much are the charges? Let's settle this matter. And you never bother to ask. So they show up with a war rant and declare war on you, kick your door in, put some funny stuff behind your back. I use zip ties. Put some zip ties behind your back or set of steel handcuffs and they haul you into jail. They're taking the vessel in a surety for the bond. 
And then what's the first thing they do? Ask him to plea into bond. Oh, what is a court? A court is a bank. You look up the word court in a legal dictionary. It says C bank, C post office. Look up the word judge. It says C banker, C postmaster. Oh, I'm going to teach you a very valuable lesson this weekend. How to use the post office to solve your cases. Okay. Sir, what about the certificate of his new name? What does that do? Nothing. You just created another entity. Don't worry about that shit. That's patriot shit. Okay? I like to keep people out of jail. Don't act as the king until you're the king. See, you can be 100% sovereign. Or you can be 100% a slave. But if you think you're sovereign and you're somewhere on this line, maybe 10%, 20%, 40%, 60%, 80% along the way, then you're making a claim that you ain't. See, you're making a false claim that you're sovereign, that you're a state national, when you haven't done the steps necessary to be the king. And those are the guys you see on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> and the police are hauling them away and impounding their cars and they're screaming that they're sovereign that they're one of we the people and not one of them sent an affidavit of repudiation to the secretary of state and got their passport to reflect that status I guarantee it because people who do they don't want in court the last thing they want to do is haul them in Because they have limited diplomatic immunity as per the Geneva Convention. They don't want me in the courtroom. In my town, in my county, I drive down the road 20 miles an hour too fast. I quite often don't put on my turn signal. I hardly ever wear my seatbelt. I'm on the phone all the time, and I wave at the cop as I go by. And he doesn't dare stop me. Because the judge... Judges in that county have said, don't bring him in here. He costs us too much money. <laughs> now, there's a problem with that, and I like to earn a living. So I bill my public servants, so sometimes I have to go to Washington State. <laughs> and every time I go to Washington State, I get pulled over. Because I'm a habitual 20 mile an hour over the speed limit driver. And I offer them my passport. I give them the way out. This is their ticket out. This is the ticket that doesn't cost them a thing. All they have to do is look at it, open it up. Well, look, yep, that's the same idiot sitting behind the wheel. <laughs> and hand it back to me and say, be on your way. Have a nice day. I won't detain you any longer. That's what they're supposed to say. And in Utah, that's what they all say to me because I get stopped every time I go to Utah. Okay? And they're smart there. And they've seen passports because the people of Utah stand up. And they've seen them. And they say, be on your way. Have a nice day. I won't detain you any longer. And police officers in Oregon tend to do that too. Even in Burns <laughs> at midnight doing 45 past McDonald's. As soon as he stopped me, I had to reward myself with a shake. <laughs> he was panicking a little bit. My nine millimeter and my Navy SEAL knife sitting on the passenger seat. He didn't want to walk back to the car with his passport because he didn't want to leave me alone. <laughs> but in Washington state, they say, can I have your driver's license, proof of insurance, and registration, please? And I look at him, I said, you don't know who I am? <laughs> I said, is this my opportunity to teach? I said, you know, in the RCW, 
I have every right to travel and hand you a passport, and I don't need a driver's license. And he says, I want it anyway. And he puts his hand on his gun. Well, that's a little bit of a mistake for him because it just cost him 10 grand. The minute he did, did that, I smile. I say, write the stinking ticket. I'll just rescission it anyway. And he writes and he hands it to me. And I say, officer, and I get his badge number. And I take the ticket and I stamp my rescission stamps across it. See, I have wonderful rescission stamps. You can, you can do all kinds of great things with rescission stamps. Okay. That's what I do to presentments. Okay. Receive, rescission, acceptance, apostille. The king's busy. I barely got time to write down date and time and sign my name. Stamp my seal. I don't need much more than that. I know it sounds funny, doesn't it? No. it sounds smart. But I just put my rescission on the ticket and I mail it back to the court. And if I should hear from them, like you have a court, a letter, another presentment, they send you back that says you have a court date on the 18th. Well, then I rescission that and I attach my, because they've waived their 72 hour period the minute they mailed me something back. So then I attach my invoice to the presentment that I rescission and I send them an invoice for 10 grand. Net due, 30 days. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. Hold on a minute. That's right. He violated my constitutional rights under threat of coercion. I could have, I could have did it for seventy-five thousand, but I'm nice. Okay. See, the increments in the United States Code is ten thousand, seventy-five thousand, two hundred fifty thousand, one million in life in prison. I love the United States Code. It is my friend. <laughs> it was put there for one reason, one reason only, and that's for we, this, we the people to hold our public servants accountable. It wasn't put there for them to hold me accountable. I'm not a public servant. Citizens, person, residents, on the other hand, they are. But I'm not one of those. So I take my presentment and I send it back to them with their first invoice, net due 30 days. They send me another one. See, I didn't offer to appear in court. I didn't, uh, I didn't give them that opportunity. So they would just magically send me another letter, another presentment that says, oh, we moved your court date up two weeks. It's this date, or I mean back two weeks. It's this date. So I take that presentment and I stamp it re received and rescissioned. And I send the invoice, net due, past due, net due 15 days. Past due, net 15 days. At the end of that 15 day time, I've usually got another presentment in the mail. And it's usually a presentment in the mail that says, don't worry about appearing in court. Just pay the bill. It's $197 plus $15 late fee. And I send them a back. I rescission that and I send it back and I say, seriously past due, 10 day opportunity to cure. Please pay my invoice in 10 days. Now I want you to understand something. Mine is now beating theirs in the order of things. Okay, so now they got 10 days, then it's judgment day. So on judgment day, what I do is I do a one page affidavit, a very simple one page affidavit. And I don't talk about the ticket. 
I don't talk about the speed, what road it was on, what the officer's name was. I talk about my banking process, that I followed banking process of 72, 30, 15, 10 judgment day. Item number one, I did this and this and this. Item number two, I did this and this and this. Item three, I did this and this. Item four, they failed to pay. And I asked the court clerk for summary judgment and administrative process on my banking process. And she gets a judge to sign it because I followed proper process. It ain't about the ticket. It ain't about the truth and the facts. No truth or facts should be tried in court. And I know that motto. It's about your processes. It's about their processes. See, there's a nine page PDF you can get online and get order and it's pr their procedure. It's the Federal Procedures Act and they don't follow their procedure. So I do my procedure properly and I get an order of judgment. Now what do I do? I say, well, a police officer violated my constitutional right, and who is his boss? The attorney general of the state. So I send my judgment, and along with my past due invoice, to the attorney general. And I've made $30,000 this year so far. <laughs> because three officers violated my constitutional rights. Now, if I worked at it, I could have made a whole lot more. I got a friend down in Texas I taught this stuff to six or seven years ago. I kept track of him for about a year, and then I lost track. He calls me up in, like, February, and I said, what are you doing? He goes, what are you doing? You still putting on seminars, teaching people all this good stuff? And I said, yeah. I said, what are you doing? He says, oh, I just go about in my life and live. I said, cool. What else you do? because I knew he was getting to something. <laughs> he says, well, I made four or 500,000 a year the last few years just billing my public servants. <laughs> nice gig if you can get it. Five minutes before lunch, okay. See, this is a big key to what I'm teaching you this weekend. Understand banking process, because all courts are banks. All judges are bankers. You want to have some fun someday? Go into your local county traffic court. Just show up at 9, sit there with a notepad, and as they run the cattle through, the chattel, as they run them through, listen to the fines, judge says so. Your fine's $197, write it down. Your fine's $1,028, write it down. And write it down up to noon. And do that in a small county like Deschutes County. And between nine and noon, that bank brought in over $30,000 to taxing the poor, which might not otherwise be taxed. You think they're not a bank? That's just traffic court. Four hours. They had four courtrooms going. I can only sit in one at a time. How, to, how much money are they running? Okay, let's just double it. Say there was just as many people with the same amount of fines in the afternoon. So that's 60 grand for each courtroom. There's four courtrooms going all day long. Yeah, you see how this is adding up? That's $240,000 a day. They're taxing the poor, which might not otherwise be taxed. Yeah. Yeah, you see how that works? Why do you want to be one of those poor? Why do you want to be taxed? Maybe you don't want to give up your 1300 Social Security money. <laughs> oh, heaven forbid. You don't give up any Social Security to be a state national. Social Security is a private annuity contract. That's how it was set up. 
Now, it's a lousy freaking investment. You could have put $25 a month away in a good mutual fund, and you'd have 10 times more at age 65 than you had through Social Security. Instead, you chose to put it in something that's only returning 1% or 2% a year. That's your mistake. But it's still a private annuity contract, and it has nothing to do with whether you're a state national or not. You don't give up something you put money into, ever. Okay? You don't give up something you put money into to be a state national. S state nationals are the king. King doesn't give that stuff up. Okay? We only have time to accept or reject. When I read this acceptance right here, this stamp, third one down, it says acceptance for trust authorized payment. Date and time, David Lester Strait Vessel, because that's what's bonded and insured, that's whose the CUSIP number is attached to the ship. You know why they put numbers on tails of airplanes? Because it's an airship. They put numbers on the ships too. Why, do they, why does every Navy ship have a number? <laughs> Start thinking. Of course it does. Yeah, inland piracy. Let's call it that. <laughs> okay, and then it says buy, and then a line hyphen executor, because I'm going to take my purple pen, and I'm going to sign it legibly. Now, here's a big mistake everybody makes. I just had a guy in jail who I had instructed don't sign anything. And they handed him this little deal, we'll let you out of jail if you sign this plea. And he says, I can't sign anything, so I'm going to just write without prejudice there. Well, Mr. Without Prejudice, you just signed something. If you put an X, if you write UCC 1-308, if you put any mark of yours at all, like doctors do, You signed it. I'm telling you, you want to stay out of jail? It takes three signatures to put a man in jail, in prison. I don't mean jail, I mean prison. It takes three signatures. The judges, the prosecutors, and either yours or whoever you gave a power of attorney to. That's why you never give away a power of attorney. You have to be the king. You can't have power of attorneys out there. You can't hire an attorney. You hire an attorney, you've lost. You want to start winning? Don't have no stinking attorney. I'm telling you, it's scary. I'll give you that. But we can teach you how to have strength and power and remain calm in the face of adversary, in the face of danger. My code name in the military, and I don't tell anybody this, and I think only one person in this room knows it, was Karma Fairy. <laughs> yeah, we all have these handles, and we don't give them to ourselves. But my code name was Karma Fairy because I just rained karma down on them. Okay. <laughs> no, that's just another CUSIP. You have multiple CUSIP numbers. They all go to your original. Thanks for bringing that up, by the way. Your birth certificate is a CUSIP number. That's your main CUSIP number. If I go down to Wells Fargo and I open an account, a checking account, that's my main checking account, my main account, right? Okay. Well, now I decided I want a savings account at Wells Fargo, so I'm going to go get a Social Security card. Now I want to 
another savings account. So I'm gonna go get a driver's license. Now I want another savings account. So I'm gonna go join the military. Now I want another savings account. So I'm gonna go get an advanced degree in college. And my student ID number is a CUSIP number. It's nine digits. Anytime they assign a nine digit number to you, three, four, seven, two, one, nine, oh, like a driver's license, that's my driver's license number. I don't need, you only need a driver's license for three things. You're gonna drive an Uber, haul passengers for hire. You need a driver's license to haul passengers for hire. You need a driver's license to haul goods for resale and interstate commerce, a truck driver. You need a driver's license if you're a public servant in the performance of your public duties. And guess what you are? A public servant. <laughs> you get it yet? You see, they get you for your lack of knowledge. God says for the lack of knowledge, my people shall fa perish and fail, right? Citizen, person, and resident, if you're any one of those things, person is an office of. You hold office, the purser on the ship. You don't own the ship. You don't control the ship. You're not the captain. You don't tell the ship what ports to go into, what contraband it can pick up. All you are is a signatory officer, the debtor aboard the ship, the purser. And you can be held in debtor's prison. Nice. Get it now? Hey, the more you achieve in life, the more they think you're worth. Yeah. What if I've told you I've seen accounts that add up to 35 billion in one person's account? And I proved it in federal court. See, I also proved something else in federal court. Exactly where the accounts are, how the court clerk fills out the SF-273, 274, and 275 form with the Department of Fiscal Services, the bean counters. See, the Department of Fiscal Services is just a building in Washington, D.C. And it's a bunch of accountants who keep track of all the accounts of the Treasury. The 337 million assessed to QV trusts. <laughs> and the courts access, as the bankers, access those trusts every day through your case number. Your case number is attached to your CUSIP number. In fact, on my do legal documents anymore, I don't even use the word case number. I use the word CUSIP attaching number. I call them out right from the beginning. See, whose name's at the top of the page? No, the creator's. The creator's name is at the top of the page. How many of you do a court document and you put the court's name up there? First District Court of Placer County. Now it's their document. Their name's at the top of the page. They created it, even if you wrote it. You just lost. That in which one creates, one controls. <clears throat> Your name goes to the top of the page. And then it may say something like, Ninth District Federal Court, or something like that. That goes down. In fact, that was kind of dumb of me. I always leave three and a half inches. Three and a half inches. Why do I leave three and a half inches there? No, so I can put a mail label 200 and a county recorder stamp on there. I'm going to make my document a quarter record. And then right here is going to be the name of the court. And it's going to say something after it like 
a private for-profit governmental services corporation <laughs> Dun & Bradstreet number redacted. That's what it's going to say. I'm going to qualify everything. Everything. And then it's going to say something like, uh, State of California versus... No, it's not. It's going to say State of California. Address, 44 Northwest Congress Avenue, Washington, D.C., a private for-profit governmental services corporation, Dun & Bradstreet number, redacted. I'm going to tell them exactly who they are. Start shoving it right up immediately. Okay? And then it's going to say versus David Lester straight all caps hyphen vessel, not defendant. It's going to say hyphen vessel. And then it's going to say by colon David Lester straight executor. <clears throat> because I hold fiduciary responsibility of my vessel. I'm the trust executor. So, David, as things heat up in society, are you you're doing these classes to educate people because you see more more of us are going to end up getting hauled into court, and you're trying to the red dragon's affecting us all, and it has been, and it's going to until March 18, 2023. Then there's going to be seven years of turmoil. There's not a thousand years of peace until 2030. This is why the UN has Agenda 2030. Yeah. Yeah. They know this shit. They know the Bible. They know the predictions. They know how all the revelations work. Are you going to cover that? You, you touched on it, the Q or whatever. I, I decided one way or the other on that. You said that's real. Are you covering that at all or not? Two, one. I got one minute now. Whew. That answer is going to take more than a minute. Yeah, that's okay. We'll get on it over the weekend. Remind me again. All right. So this is how it goes. And now instead of case number, everybody writes case number. I don't. I write CUSIP attaching number. I'm going to let them know. I know they're attaching it to my CUSIP. Okay. CUSIP attaching number, nine digit number. Now you want to have fun. Give them the bank and the routing number and your account number. <laughs> and then say, don't freaking touch. You ain't the signatory. See, under the public charitable trust, under that umbrella, you are the co-trustees, the co-beneficiaries, and the only signatory officer. They can't touch it without your permission. You know what? The Department of Fiscal Services will tell you that the Department of Justice is the largest contributor to the federal budget by far. That's taxes. That's tariffs. Everything here comes out of your SESTA QV trust. Through our court systems in the United States, they collect one trillion a day. That's more in 25 days than our entire gross domestic product of the United States in a year. And they do it out of your accounts that you don't even know you have until today. All they got to do is give you a case number and fill out a bid bond upon indictment. Fill out a performance bond upon trial and then fill out a payment bond upon sentencing. And then they hold your body as surety for the bond and they throw the body in jail. And under the federal rules of criminal procedure, you could have just signed over your house and left your body free. Now, you wouldn't have had a place to live but they'll take your house instead of your body. They don't give it. 
what surety is. It is. Most people don't even know that. It's rule 1001. Okay. So they hold your body as surety while they collect on your trust. Everything is a banking term. An indictment is a true bill. If you don't pay the bill, you're brought up on charges. You don't pay the charges, you're asked to bond. You don't pay the bond, they hold you as surety while they collect on your trust. Now, is that not all banking diction? Yes. <laughs> and you thought they were after you. <laughs> Oh, you're, you're meeting the ransom demands of the kidnappers, huh? <laughs> I don't meet the ransom demands of my kidnappers. I destroy them. They still have my daughter. I know. Where do they live? Um, I don't mean where your daughter lives. Oh, well, your mom has. Okay. Oh, her mom. Well, ASPA and Title IV of Social Security say they cannot take a child away from a parent without the parent's consent. Unless the parent has been tried through proper due process law and found guilty of a felony. Once they've paid their price to society, that means they've met all requirements, including probation. Then the child is to be returned back to the parent. The object of the act of Congress, the law in which we the people laid down, was never an intent to take or remove a child from a parent. Congress never intended for that to ever happen. But see, that created the agency and it set up the funding so they get paid. Now, there's another bit of funding that they get paid on. And that's the off-book funding. So every child is worth $3.3 million to the state. The state takes your child. It's the state that traffics children. It's the state that runs drugs. It's the state that runs guns. Okay? You don't think the state runs guns? They confiscate millions of guns from people who have a Second Amendment right to keep them. And what do they do with those guns? Oh, they sell the heck out of them. They make so much money as trafficking weapons. It's not even funny. And they traffic your cars that they own and they traffic you, and they traffic your children. See that 3.3 million? 1.5 million comes out of the mother Sesta QV Trust. 1.5 million comes out of the father Sesta QV Trust. 300,000 comes from ASFA and Title IV over the first 24 month period in payments. See, if it was my kids, I'd hold them firmly by the wrist while I slept.